Okay, so uh, thank you everyone for joining and uh, let's then begin the session. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, first we'll begin by exploring, exploring some of the areas of opening. So as you can see, this is eventy.com. This is using the uh, open source uh, open event uh, code base to run basically. And uh, as you can see, the home page has three sections featured events call for speakers and upcoming events so basically an event is you know just like a real life event which can run across several days it can be online it can be physical or it can be both and then there's also uh, my manage event sections where i can see uh, the events i am conducting i'm the organizer of and then uh, there's event details section and everything so uh, there are three kinds of users basically on uh, event here. One is the admin. So uh, for example, I can check the admin section of the, the site, which a normal user can't, and have access to all the events of the uh, site. Then there's organizer, a person who organizes an event, and they can see basically access all the information about the event, like who's attending, who has signed up, and see the tickets and orders, discount codes and everything. And uh, the, the lowest tier is a normal attendee, so someone who has bought the tickets. So um, these are the three tiers of uh, users. There are also uh, other permissions uh, as organizers, and we'll discuss that uh, you know, in a moment. So the, the topic of this uh, workshop is how to install and uh, get uh, open event server and front end up and running. So open event has two components. One is the server, which has all the logic and, uh, you know, basically authentication, authorization, database access APIs. And one is front end, which is basically the site you're seeing. It connects with the API and shows the information which is necessary to process it. So first we'll go through server and then we'll go through front end. And because uh, basically this is an interactive session, I'll be taking stops in between and asking you questions if, if you have any doubts. So uh, please write your doubts in chat as well. So when, whenever I stop, I'll uh, come to chat and see if you have any questions and answer them. So first, we'll start by installing the server. So as you can see, I'm on the server repository. and. Uh, the first thing we check out whenever we started an open source project is the readme file, which is rendered by default on GitHub. So uh, here I can see that there's installation instructions. So I'm going to choose local installation instructions and see that the dependency is required to run the server of Python 3.8, Postgres, and OpenSSL. So let's uh, do uh, uh do, let's do the steps one by one and i'm basically using a, a clean slate docker image of ubuntu so anything that you uh, uh, face uh, while installing it in a bare metals machine i'll face that as well so uh, we'll solve that together so that i do not uh, i do not skip a problem which you might have on a clean machine whereas uh, you know a, a, a setup machine which i already have so then let's go to step one so the step one of starting with any project is to basically clone the project and uh, you, if you want to contribute to a project you need to fork it and clone your fork but because i'm going to uh, basically uh, install this project only and I'm not going to contribute. I don't have, I already have a fork uh, and it might be behind a bit. I'm just going to clone the uh, origin, the, the upstream repository itself. So I'm going to clone this.
and once it has been cloned, I'll cd into the directory. Now I'm in this directory, I'm on the development branch. Now the next thing uh, I need to do is install the system dependencies. We have instructions for Mac OS, but the, um, the guide assumes that you're using Linux. So uh, Mac OS instructions may be a little bit outdated. So let's go to the Debian Ubuntu instructions, which I'm using, and also is the recommended development platform for both server and front end. And let's copy this command. Once we cd into the directory, almost all the commands assume that you are in the directory. So uh, sometimes people are not in the open event server directory and they run the command and then they face there. So please uh, ensure that you are in the directory when you're running these commands. So I run this, I put in my password, and I press yes on installing the dependencies. So while these dependencies are being installed, uh, I'll ask that if some people have any questions. So by now, I think nobody has any question. So if you do have any question, don't wait and just write it in the chat so that when I take a break, I can look at it and answer them. So when, uh, for example, now you are seeing this uh, error that something was not found. So this happens when your repositories are not updated. So for that, as you can see that uh, Debian is helpful and it says that you, you may run this command to uh, face this problem. So I'm going to run sudo apt update. So this is the first command you basically run when you install a new uh, Ubuntu system or something else. But sometimes the repositories are updated in between. And if you face this not found error, you can run this sudo apt update command. So now let me install the uh, let, let me run the command again and uh, get with the installing of the dependencies. So now this uh, installation command has given me a prompt to uh, enter my time zone information. Uh, if you are basically running a configured Ubuntu, it already has the time zone information, but because I'm running it in Docker, it does not. So I'll just put in Asia and Kolkata to set up my time zone. So now the command has completed, but it has given this instruction that if you want to start the database server, you must run this command. So basically, uh, most of the time when you install PostgreSQL, it starts automatically, but sometimes it does not. So to check if it is running or not, I can write PSQL. And it is saying that uh, could not connect to server, which means that it, it is not running. So let's run this command, which was given to us in the installation instructions. So now it's saying that you must run this uh, as cluster owner, Postgres, or root. So there are two ways you can run this command. Either you can switch the user to Postgres and run this command, or you can just run it as sudo. So I'm going to run this as sudo. And now the server is running. And uh, if I run this command again, uh, it gives us an error that uh, role docker does not exist. Uh, still, it means that it's running. If I want to confirm it, I can again switch to Postgres user. And I, 
I have now entered the uh, command line interface of PostgreSQL. So now it means that the server is running. I'm going to quit it and then move on to the next command. An important thing to note is that the server is only compliant with Python 3.8. So if you have Python 3.9 or Python 3.7, it won't work. So uh, luckily, uh, the Python version which was installed with this was Python 3.8.2, which is Python 3.8, so it will work. But if you do not have Python 3.8 installed by default, then you might uh, you might need to use PyEnv to install it. So PyEnv allows you to run multiple versions of Python simultaneously. So it's very important. Uh, but because we are short on time, and I'm just demonstrating how to do this, uh, I'm going I'm going to skip that part because I already have Python 3.8. But if you face problem like that, uh, use PyEnv. So now uh, we will go to the next step, and uh, which is installing Poetry. Poetry is like pip. It's a Python package manager. But pip has limitations, like it does not have a proper uh, dependency locking mechanism. So sometimes, if I install a package uh, and I uh, use it on uh, pip on server to install it again, uh, it might result in two different package versions, which might result in incompatibility. So for example, if I say I want request 3, and while I was installing it locally, it was request 3.1. Now, uh, once I ins uh, install it on server, 3.2 or 3.3 might be released. And it might uh, cause uh, co uh, compliance errors. So Poetry locks dependencies versions. And also, it has a dependency resolution system, which PIP does not have. So in PIP, order of listing dependencies matter. So uh, in Poetry, you can list it any way you want. It should uh, always re result in reproducible builds. So I'm going to copy this command to install Poetry. It gives me two errors that curl is not found and Python is not found. First, let's solve first error, curl not found. So sometimes uh, when you're running some command, it may happen that the required dependency uh, is not pre-installed. So you might have to install it uh, manually, which we do by apt. So sudo apt install curl. So anything which is not found, first you should try to sudo apt install and the name of the dependency. So I'm going to do that. And I'm going to run this command again. Now it's saying that Python is not found. But how is this possible? Uh, we installed Python uh, just two commands before. So in modern versions of Ubuntu, Python is not installed by default. Or if you're using an old version like Ubuntu 18, Python may resolve to Python 2 by default. And that's, that's not good, because we want Python 3.8 to be used. So a very easy way of doing that is to explicitly write Python 3. So now, as you can see, Python 3.8.5 prompt is created. Or you can even be even more explicit if you have multiple versions of Python 3, like Python 3.6 or Python 3.7. You can say Python 3.8. And that will also resolve to Python 3. So I am going to run this command, and I'm going to say Python 3. Now it will uh, start downloading poetry and installing it. And uh, one thing important to note is the instructions given in the installation prompt, which says that uh, it will add it, this to this uh, repository, uh, a particular directory, and you have to add it in environment variables, path, and everything. So a general rule of thumb is that if you install something and it requires sudo, it is added to the path by default because it is in bin or something else. You use a local bin or user bin. But if you do not install something with root or sudo, it means that you have to manually add it into the path. So as you can see, that it's saying that uh, if you log in another time, if you open a new terminal, it will be by default added to your path. But 
if you want to do this in, in this current shell, you have to run this command. So I'm just going to copy this command and run it. And similarly, you could also run this command, uh, which would have the same effect. Then the next step is to run poetry install. And this throws an error, saying that the currently activated version Python 3.8.5 is not supported by the project to Python 3.8.6. We have basically locked the Python version to Python 3.8.6 because we do not want people uh, with Python 3.7 or Python 3.9 trying the project and then uh, you know coming across errors. But because I know that Python 3.8.5 and Python 3.8.6 are compatible, I'm going to change this in uh, in the configuration. However, I recommend that you use PyENV to install the correct version, the required version of the project. But as we are short on time, I'm just going to edit the project configuration. So we get an error and we're not found. We again use the same command to install them. So do I have to install and then the name of the software we want to install. Now I'm going here and making the Python to be Python 3.8.5. Again, this is a workaround just for demonstration purposes, but you should actually install the required Python version. So I'm again going to run this command, poetry install. So now you can read that poetry is treating a virtual environment. So what is a virtual environment? If you install something using pip, like pip install something, it installs it globally. So it may happen that two different Python projects may have different requirements. Like one may require Python uh, re request 2.4, other may require request 3.6, and it may res res uh, result in conflicts. So rather using virtual environments, we install uh, per project dependencies in a particular folder. But the project will not know where to look for its dependencies and tell an unless you activate a virtual environment. And that's why we activate this virtual environment using source and something else. But poetry makes it very easy to do so. It automatically creates a virtual environment and activates it. So if you find yourself that uh, you have installed some dependencies and the project may, uh, is not finding them, you um, you get treated with module not found error. First, see that the virtual environment is enabled or not. So for example, right now, virtual environment is not enabled. And the next step in, is written that you, if you uh, uh, want to activate the project's virtual environment, you need to run poetry shell. Once I run it, as you can see, I'm in the virtual environment. And this is signified by a bracket and the name of the virtual environment. So this is how you know that you are within a virtual environment. To deactivate it, to return to a normal non-virtual environment, you have to write deactivate. But again, I'm going to just run poetry shell to get into the virtual environment. Then I have to run this pre-commit install. So what is a pre-commit? So basically, if you create a pull request and it has some changes which, uh, like the imports are not sorted, you have imported something and are not using it, or the files are not properly formatted, this is something which is uh, which will already be rejected without going further. So that's why we want to ease the contributors by automatically sorting the imports removing unused imports and formatting the files. Uh, and we have already configured that. So whenever you commit, it automatically uh, runs and it does that for you. So for that, you you want to pre-commit install. Uh, let me activate the virtual environment again. And now pre-commit install. And this is installed now in the directory. Then we come to the next step of creating the database. 
So till now, does anyone have any question? Okay. So if you have any question, again, write it in the chat. So now let's move on to the next section, creating the database. So first, we, what we want to do is we want to make ourselves the super user in PostgreSQL so that we don't have to run the commands as Postgres user using sudo again and again. It's recommended that you do not use sudo um, a lot. Uh, you know, you don't make use of sudo normal because of, uh, then you may, uh, uh, you know, run some command which is not, uh, you know, which is not safe. And uh, so thus we want to reduce the use of sudo in our terminal as much as possible. So I'm going to first create myself uh, make myself the super user so i'm going to run the command and then i'm going to create the database for open event and the test data now there's uh, additional information that this method is PA authentication method. It does not need password authentication, and it is easier to write and uh, do on a local machine. Then we have some instruction for Mac users. If you're using Mac, you can use them. Then we come to the next step of generating the configuration. So first, we copy this .env.example file to .env, and let's see what's present in .env. This database URL, this test database URL, then there's some configuration. So basically, environment variables uh, on servers are used to configure the software. And uh, when we are developing locally, it becomes difficult to manage environment variables because we don't always know what's set uh, there by default. And it may you may lose environment variables when you restart your um, you know operating system. So we use .env files. And the syntax is the name of the environment variable equal, and then the value of the environment variable. Then we see that this is, uh, uh, we have to add a secret key here. And this is the step which a lot of people miss. So we need to add the secret key to the project. If you don't add it, it will run, but it will uh, give a warning. And uh, in production mode, it won't run at all. So this secret key is used to sign the uh, login tokens and uh, there's some other cryptographic stuff that happens and it is very important that you do not share this secret key with anyone else because if two servers have same secret key it means that one user of the server can log into another user of the server so that's not good so for example if i have uh, secret keys, uh, same as secret key on eventier.com, and I am the user with ID one, and I generate the token locally. It will also work on eventier.com, and I will be logged in as user one, which might be admin. So that's why it needs to be random and uh, you know secure. So I'm going to copy the command which is given to uh, generate the random uh, string. And then I'm going to copy this and add this in .env. Secret key. And then add this. Then we have next command, which is creating the database tables. So I run. Python 3, create db.py. I have to enter the email for super admin. I recommend you to enter your real email here because it might receive uh, some, you know, uh, emails to verify your email and everything. And if you do not have access to the email you put in here, you might not be able to verify it. So I'm going to put a password. This is a new password. You can put anything here, but you have to remember it, obviously. And then the database tables are now created. I run the next step to 
stamp the head of the database to mark that the migration has completed. Then uh, in the next case, uh, we uh, it is written that if you have some different password and username as in, uh, given in the instructions here, you have to change the database URL accordingly. Then we uh, start the application. So we ignore the salary process for now because it's not needed, it's not compulsory, and we run the application using Python 3 managepy and server. And now the server is running. So let me show you that how you can guess that the server is running. If I curl on localhost 5000, I give this entire illegible HTML. So that's not good. But if I go here, uh, localhost 5000 v1 slash settings, I can get I get this information, which means that the server is running. There are some settings. If I go to even slash events you can see that uh, i get data uh, there's no event right now but i'm getting the data so basically the hello world of our uh, this uh, server is just slash even slash settings so it's working but let, now let me sh uh, show you that what happens if you access this localhost 5000 on your machine so let me so I'm going to go back to my browser and when I open localhost 5000, I get this documentation. So it is open event API server documentation. It has information about how to authenticate with the server, how to create an event, how to register a user, and everything. And similarly, I can go to v1 slash settings and here I can see that most of the things are null, but I have settings. Similarly, there's events. And one more cool thing about it is that we have very basic support, very initial support of GraphQL. So I can come here and write query and settings. And you can see there's autocomplete in here. So I don't have to guess what things will be returned in the API. I can get app name, I can get cookie policy, and then if I query, I get the, the settings back. So this is basically how you set up the server, and, and now the server is up and running. The next would be how to set a front end, but before that, do we have any question? Cool. So uh, then let's move to front end. So the server is the brain of the project. Front end is the UI. And uh, similarly, we have local installation instructions for front end as well. It's much easier to install front end than server, but server as well is not that bad. As you saw, we installed it uh, within 20 minutes. So first, let's uh, see the dependencies of the project. 
So we need Git. We have that already. If you don't, you can install it using sudo apt install git. Then we know you uh, need node 14. So if I go to the link, there's the download uh, link. So you can uh, use that. But uh, I'm going to use the command line for installing it. Uh, and uh, let's do that. Then. So as I said, if you want to install something, you generally write sudo apt install. And then if we want to install node, we write no. So if I enter the password, I say that there's no, I see that there's no package node. So if you search, you'll find that the package name is called node.js on Linux. So I run sudo apt install node.js and now it will be installed. If I run node dash dash version, you'll notice that it says 10.19.0, but I want node 14. So what happens is that uh, sometimes, as I said previously, you do not have the correct required version of the dependency. So we need to use uh, something like NVM to install multiple versions of node. So let's go and search NVM. Let's go to the project and we have this installation instruction. So I'm going to copy this and run it. So like when we installed poetry, it, this also it did not use sudo. And thus, we need to add something in the uh, environment for, for being able to use the command. So, now I've in, in, uh, exported the required uh, environment variables. Now, if I run in VM, I get this entire information. So this, you can see the syntax. It's very simple. I run NVM install and 14.16.0. For example, uh, any node version you want, want to install. So I'll just run it. It will download the proper version of node and set it up for me. So uh, because there was no proper node version installed before, it has uh, installed 14.16.0 uh, and set the default version to 14.16.0 as well. So if I say node dash dash version is 14.16.0, but let's say you installed uh, multiple version of node, let's say node 15, node 13, node 12, node 10. And if you want to use a specific version or make it default, you can use this command, nvm alias default and the node version. But as I have installed and set the correct version as default, I'm going to go ahead with the documentation of front end. So now I need to install yarn. If I go to the site, you can see that you can install it using npm. So if you when, once you install the correct version of node, npm is installed with it. So I'm just going to run this command and this work. The next step in the documentation is to clone the project. So uh, again, it is recommended that you fork the project first, but for demonstration purposes, I'm just going to clone it directly. Now the project has been cloned. I cd into the project. And the next thing is that we want to install the dependencies using the yarn command. While the dependencies are being installed, do we have any questions still now?
to so the dependencies have installed now the next step is to again copy dot env dot example dot to dot env and let's see what's present in dot env here this map box access, access token api host which we'll talk about in a bit and some other configuration like server you can configure the front end using dot env command here as well now we run the next command Elton and generate now i get this error that get text is not found so for this we need a program called get text and that's this is why it becomes difficult for people using windows because a lot of dependencies are not uh, present on windows and uh, are also difficult to install so for that uh, i recommend that you use linux or if you still have to use windows use wsl2 uh, so i'm going to install get text using sudo apt install get text sir hello yeah Sir, can you hear me? Uh, Dev here. Yeah. Yeah, sir. Sushant has any doubt. Yeah. So, Sushant has written, can we set up this project using Docker Compose, something like that? What if we don't want to install anything on my local, like Postgres can't use Docker image? So, for deployment of the project, Docker is recommended. We have instruction for deployment using Docker. But for development, we do not recommend Docker because uh, for development you may uh, you will need to then rebuild the image again and again and uh, there is a way that you can mount the project you know in the docker container but it's it's not that uh, intuitive so for local development we do not recommend docker and uh, for front end itself docker would not be feasible anyway uh, because uh, it, it requires rewatching the uh, config, uh, configurations and source files and regenerating the project. So uh, if you want to deploy the project, yes, Docker is completely recommended. You do not need to install Postgres or anything. But uh, if you want to develop it locally, you anyway would you know kind of need it, uh, Postgres and everything. We may think in future to have a development version of the uh, docker image a lot of people try it and they realize that it's not that great because uh, it requires constant rebuilding so that's why we do not recommend uh, docker for development for deployment this is the it is the def uh, definitive and supported way of uh, deploying the open image server and front end board. so uh, i hope that answered your question and uh, if you have any other you can write it in the uh, chat again so you can see that we have finished the, the, com uh, the generate command and then let's see what's the next step in the installation instructions so this important notes it about people for uh, people using mac and uh, other stuff and then we can start the server using command yarn start i'm uh So now the front end is uh, being built and it's uh, a bit heavy command it requires a lot of cpu and energy users so it might take some time if you have um, 
uh, you know less resources uh, i basically have 16 gb ram and still takes a huge chunk of my memory so the deprecation warnings and errors you have seen are from the third party dependencies they're using so unfortunately this uh, is not something we can solve so just ignore that if you see uh, anything like that uh, however if you get a real error the build process will stop and uh, it won't succeed uh, some people have problems that they think the process is stuck and it's working so if you think that the process is stuck you can press enter and if you return back to terminal it means that it's not stuck so that's a way of knowing that if the process is stuck or not so now i'm saying that serving on uh, localhost 4200 so let me go to localhost 4200 and now you are able to see that i have this empty page so it looks like uh you know this uh event.com but it has no events that's because i'm connected to uh, this uh, local uh, database which does not have any event so this is basically how you install front end as well along with the uh, server let me first clear the application settings and reload the page so here you can see it is written open event and uh, basically this is the dev server it is connected to if we want to connect it to our local server so we are we have local server running on localhost 5000 so if we want it to be connected to that i can go to dot env file and change the api host to localhost 5000 and when i run the server again uh, it will be connected to my local server and uh, similarly if you want to solve an error which for example is on eventia.com you can go to env and change the api host to https api.eventia.com and it will work uh, it will be connected to uh, you know eventia.com as it is connected to the dev server or the local server so sometimes you see a uh, link on uh, issue on front end and it says that this is the problem and people click on it and they say that i cannot access the link it may be because it's uh, for an event which is not owned by you so for that you can create your own event on eventia.com and uh, link the project the front end project uh, locally to api.eventia.com and fix it so for example now it's running again and if i reload the page now it's linked to my local server i can log in i'll put in the super user email and password and now i can access the admin page as well so uh, continuing from the thing I was talking about, there may also be a link which may link to a event uh, admin section of eventia.com. And that is something that you cannot even create yourself. For example, if there's a link for event organizer page, you can create your own event and get access to your own event organizer page and solve an issue. But if it is a link of admin section, if it is a bug, or feature implementation of admin section, then you cannot access admin section on eventia.com. So you will need to deploy your own server locally and then uh, basically uh, link your front end 
development uh, environment to local host 5000. So for example, I go to settings, now I can see and change settings to my local server. So for example, if I change the app name to let's say October 1st, so this app name is eventa on eventa.com, I can change it to anything else, putting in API URL as localhost 5000, tagline to have fun. Email. Skip save. And remove the cache of settings. And now if I reload the page, you can see it says October 1st. So for example, if you want to deploy the server and front end for your college fest, you can change it to your liking. And uh, basically, this is how both server and front end are deployed and connected to each other. So till now, does anyone else have any other question? Yes, uh, if you have any question, you can also turn on your microphone and speak directly. Yeah, you can also speak in Hindi if you want. Hello. Hello. Yes. Event wala uh, hega wo apna main website ne. Hmm. Wo uh, same nahi dikha raha hai. Uh, what is the error you are getting? Uh, kya error show hai? Uh, aisa same aara hai. No upcoming events only local host page. yeah so uh, that's what i explained so um, when you install the server and front end locally you do not have any event aapko koi event nahi hai to aapko koi event nahi dikhega so if you want to have an event you have to create an event so if you create an event you will start seeing it on the front page if it fulfills some criteria otherwise you can create an event and go to management section and you see it there so you won't see the same thing as eventia.com because eventia.com uh, the database is different the api is uh, is different so you won't see that locally because your local database is not same as the database on eventia.com yeah, so if you want that, you will need to uh, change the uh, .env file and write uh, api.eventia.com as API host here. So if, if you write this here and run your and start, then you will see uh, same uh, events as on eventia.com. But then again, you don't have access to admin or organizer section. So once this builds, I'll show you that even on localhost 4200, you'll see those events. Achha. Ek aur baat puchna tha aap se. Ye apna yaran hai aur npm hai ga. 
satu अपन npm use नहीं कर रहा है इधर नो इन दिस प्रोजेक्ट वी आर यूजिंग यार्न तो इस प्रोजेक्ट में हम यार्न यूज कर रहे हैं बिकॉज़ एट द टाइम यार्न वाज मच फास्टर देन npm एंड इवन टुडे आई वुड से इन माय एक्सपीरियंस यार्न इज मच फास्टर सो दैट्स व्हाई वी आर यूजिंग यार्न अच्छा सर जी ओके ओके so now as you can see i am on localhost 4200 and i can see the same events as on uh, eventry.com okay okay sir ji okay yahan pe lekin changes nahi kar sakta code base mein ja ke aur jahan pe changes aa jaye same aisa nahi hoga so any change you do in open event front end will uh, be the ui change so you can still do that i can go to um, the, uh, i can go to the event card file i can change the background color of event card and it will show uh, black here if i change it to black so you can still do that acha acha it won't but obviously it won't show up on uh, event.com unless that change it uh, that change is merged into the code base acha sir ji theek hai aa gaya aa gaya so does anyone else have any other question Okay, so so then uh, I, I think we we'll move to the next section, which uh, is the exploration of code base. So first, let me open up. so this is the code base and uh, this is the server code base and uh, it's vast so we'll not be going too much into detail but i'm just showing you some of the things that others also asked so this is for example docker compose.yml so uh, the nice thing about this is that if you want to deploy open event server somewhere you don't have to install postgres and everything you don't have to configure a lot of stuff you simply have to do three steps you have to clone the repository you have to copy dot env dot example into dot env you have to add a secret key and then you have to just run the command docker compose up dash d so once you do that uh, we have postgres redis and everything pre configured in this file <coughs> so uh, the containers for each of the required dependencies will run and you won't have to configure anything but obviously it's not recommended for development because you will have to recompile and uh, recreate the images again and again and uh, this uh, we push the images on every commit on development branch and also tag commits on uh, master branch whenever we create a release so uh, for deployment purposes docker compose is the preferred solution this is also how we uh, deploy on production in production and uh, we have integration tests and unit tests so uh, whenever you create a new feature recommended you add that the main code is present in the app folder and it's uh, separated by layers so api extension graphql models so models are basically uh, tables uh, you know represented in objects so for example we have the event model which have which has all these particular columns and this is what we use uh, basic sql alchemy model to map between the database rows and python objects and then we have api which is the crux of the whole uh, ecosystem and we have different apis like mesh api and services 
and sessions. And we are using JSON API uh, to, uh, uh, which is a spec API format, uh, and it has different spec on how to sort and filter and uh, join and uh, model relationships. So this is basically uh, the API section of it. And then we have schemas. So schemas are related to the JSON structure. So for example, a model may have sensitive information like password and uh, you know email that we might not want to leak. Or also we, we would want to have some kind of validation that if someone is putting in a minimum quantity and maximum quantity, minimum should be less than maximum and so on and so forth. So we add that in schema. So this three layer system goes that at the core, we have models, then we have schema and the API bridges the schema and model uh, and uh, uses schema to either deserialize some stuff or serialize some stuff out of the system. So this is basically how the code of the server works. Does anyone have any question uh, related to uh, server architecture? Do, do they want to uh, ask anything about the server, or, uh, or do they uh, do they want to understand anything about the server? Then uh, next, let's explore. Yes, does anyone have any question? Uh, yes, Arif, I have one. So like event is a bit big platform. So if I want to contribute to a part of it, how can I how can I find that particular component? Or yeah, like that that particular part of the project? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question in uh, regards to what we were going to discuss in terms of exploration of front end. So let's go to front end. And uh, let me also first, because we were discussing uh, the server itself, show you that if, for example, you want to search for uh, or debug a particular part of API, how will you do that? Let's say uh, you have uh, to debug a big blue button API, right? Or, for example, you have to debug video stream API. So we have conveniently named the folders and uh, files in this corresponding to APIs present in them. So if you want to check video stream API, you can com see, simply come here and see that there's a video stream.py file here. And another way is that you write control P and you write video stream. So everything related to video stream will come up. The API, the model, the schema, and other stuff. So let's say I go to video stream API, and uh, I have several things here. Like, for example, I have join stream endpoint. So whenever you uh, open a particular stream, for example, even this page when you open, this route was called, and this uh, code ran. So first, it found a stream. And if uh, it, it was not present, it gives 404. And then it checks that if the user can access the stream or not. So in the video stream model itself, we have this function, user can access or not. So first we check that if the user is moderator, then obviously the user can access it. So user is moderator function checks that, OK, if the user is staff, which means that if the user is the admin or is the user co-organizer of the event, then it will automatically return true, right? So if you are a co-organizer or organizer of an event or the owner of an event or you are an admin, you are allowed to join uh, the video stream and not only join it, but also join it as a moderator. Uh, so if you are in big blue button, you'll autom automatically be made a moderator. Otherwise, we check the video moderators and uh, see that the e uh, user's email should be in that list. And thus, you may, will also be a moderator. 
Otherwise, if you are not a moderator, but you are a speaker of the event, then also you can join uh, a particular video stream. Otherwise, we check that the current user should have a ticket for the uh, event. So if you have a ticket for it and that ticket has been completed or placed, then also you are able to join a session. Right. So once it is confirmed, uh, if the user cannot access the session, we throw an error that video stream not found. We don't even want to uh, say that video stream is found. We just say it does not exist. Otherwise, then we create the um, big blue button uh, room and we create the join token. We put in either the public name of the, of the user or the full name or the anonymous name of the user. And uh, we make the user moderator. If, uh, it, uh, if the person has moderator access, otherwise the person is an attendee and we join it. So basically, this is how a standard flow of authentication authorization works. And similarly, I can also come here to the chat token function. So if you see in the chat uh, side panel, there's a chat option. And whenever you click on that, this endpoint is ran. And again, we get this video stream. We check if the user can access video stream or not. And if they can, we get the rocket chat token and return. Otherwise, we handle the error. And then this video stream list uh, object, you know, we do the same kind of checks and balances there. Before posting, we validate the data or otherwise, before getting, we do some stuff as well. So this is how we basically uh, find a, a, an API. Similarly, if you want to find setting API, I can write setting here after uh, pressing Control P in Visual Studio Code, and I can go to setting API, and then there I can see the logic here as well. So we have various hooks like before get, before post, before update, before delete and they get run after appropriate uh, HTTP uh, you know, methods. So this is how you find something in server. Let's say you want to find something in front end. So this is the front end part portion. Let me just Hello, Arif. Could yeah. you please uh, hide the uh, message event.com sharing your yes. screen, please? Thank you. OK, so this is the front end code base. And uh, this has various parts. So the main pa uh, project part is present in the app folder. And this has components, config controllers, extensions, helpers models routes. So if you want to start on a particular uh, page and you want to understand it where the code of that page is, the first, uh, the easiest way to do it is to go to router.js. Router.js lists all the pages uh, in the project. And uh, this is where sh you should start. So for example, let's say you are on this page itself and it says, eventy.com slash e slash some num some identifier slash video slash workshop slash some 299. So how to find that? How where to find this particular page, the logic of that page? So you go to the routes one by one. It's login register, is it password, this that. You come to this this dot route public and you see that the path is slash e slash event ID which means that it matches with the path which is written in your URL, right? And then you go again in this route, and this it's the nested route. So you come here and you see, oh, this dot route or stream matches slash video slash video name. And then again, uh, here it is route view, which matches stream ID, which means that it is public, stream view. 
and then we have a route for that. So uh, if I go to that route, now I am in the entry point of what happens when I go to the URL in my URL bar. So whenever you go to a page in front end, the route is the first part that gets executed. So here I can see that there's title token and render template. The main part of the route is the model. Model fetches the data which needs to display on a page. So first we get the event for which we are displaying the video stream. And then we fetch the video stream using the video ID in the parameters. Right, and, and th this is the logic of fetching, but where's the logic of the UI? So it's present in the template. So again, if I search public stream view, I have this template file, view.hbs, where we can write any HTML, but also we can write uh, use components here. So I can see that we have used a public stream video stream component. And uh, let's then go to this thing, public stream video stream. And now I have a component.ts file and also an HBS file. So first, let's say in the video stream.ts file, I have this component which has a lot of instance variables. It's a JavaScript class and it runs setup. So if I go to the HBS file, this is the logic. This is the template which gets run when the route is uh, uh, you know, executed. So I have this, this did insert this dot setup, which means whenever this component is into, inserted into the uh, page, this function will be run. So in this function, we load the video stream. And if we uh, see that the provider is JC, we stop loading something. If the provider is YouTube, we extract the ID and set the YouTube ID. If the provider is Vimeo, we set the Vimeo ID. If the provider is big blue button, then we uh, then we get the uh, URL join URL using this join video stream function we saw in the server just right now. And we do this all of these things. We set the iframe URL. And in the template, we just use the same instance variable in this uh, component that if something is loading, we show the loader. If we have the iframe URL, we simply show this iframe. So in, if it is Jitsi, then the iframe URL will, uh, sorry, if it is big blue button, then we show this iframe URL, which was uh, shown using the uh, join video uh, API call. Otherwise, if the video uh, provider is Jitsi, we again use this Jitsi stream component, which we'll come to in a bit. Otherwise, if it is YouTube, then we use this YouTube iframe. If it is a Vimeo, we use this Vimeo iframe. And then we have this side panel component that you have in, in all the video rooms. So again, uh, let's say you have a bug in Jitsi stream. So you can search Jitsi stream and you come across this component and also this template. So in GC stream, we have this div and uh, we have this function which runs whenever this component is instantiated. We get the stream, we get the channel, we configure what kind of buttons we want to show. Uh, and then we call the external API on Jitsi and insert it into the document. So this is the level by level drilling of how to you reach into the component. But there's another way if you want to visually do this. So let's say I'm on eventia.com. I want to see that what is the component which is used here. I want to change something in this. So you can install Ember Inspector, which is the uh, dev tool for Ember. And if I go here, and if I click on this and say inspect Ember component, I will be shown that this is event card. 
and it is highlighted that what is covered by this component. It is highlighted that what is the argument of this component and what is the function which is part in this component. And this is how basically you do it. A component is made of multiple uh, components, which is also shown this way here. That event card has component of safe image. It has smart overflow. It has event date and time, and it has event venue and uh, another smart overflow and so on. So this is basically how you can uh, get to a component, or if you want to uh, understand, uh, you know bit by bit then it is the route controller component and this is how you drill into bits and pieces so by now does anyone have any question if uh, if you want to ask something about the platform itself any uh, general question about uh, setting it up or uh, you know some kind of thing you you're interested in in the platform how does it work how how something happens so we can take up those questions as well so neha asks what are hbs files so hbs files are handlebar files so handlebar is a, a templating format so i am showing you the file itself so let's see so this is a handlebar file and uh, like in react you have jsx in view you have view templates in ember you have handlebar files to do the uh, uh, template formatting and uh, logistics so if you want to conditionally show something, you can write if a statement. If you want to loop over something, you can write the for statement. And uh, you have multiple ways of uh, checking something. For example, if you want to check if something is equal to something else, you use the equal helper. And if you want to check multiple things, you use the and helper and so on. So this is basically uh, how you show uh, something in a uh, handlebar file. So this is also, for example, if we go to video room form, you have each helper if you want to loop over something. So let's say I want to show the emails of uh, a video room moderator, I loop over data stream moderators and then show the moderator email and uh, map the action to it. So uh, handlebars is used to conditionally uh, create and, uh, interactive UIs. So do we have any questions, any uh, thing you want to uh, Asked about the platform itself, not necessarily related to coding, but uh, any other thing as well, we can take it up. I know. Yeah. Yes, yes, you can ask something if you want. Uh, I can't I can't understand what, what you are saying. Um, does anyone else understand what uh, you should uh, say? Yes, sir. He's asking about good first issues to start with a contribution. Okay. So there are there may be some issues marked good first, 
uh, in the in the front end repository um, there are also low priority issues that you can start with i particularly don't have anything in my mind you know currently so uh, i don't know but uh, other people can help you out on the getter channel as well you can join the channel which i think uh, people have linked above and they'll be able to point you to some easy issues then do, uh, does anyone have any other question uh, yes sir jaise ki gsoc mein hame proposal submit karna hota hai to matlab maine blogs wagaira mein padha tha ki aap apna proposal pehle review wagaira karwa lo to kya wo proposal jab proposal ka time start hota hai uske baad review karwate hain usse pehle hum review karwa lete hain matlab main puchna cha raha hu 29 march se pehle bhi hum review karwa sakte hain so uh, basically raj has asked about uh, a question about gsoc and he is asking that whether uh, he may ask some mentor to review his application proposal before the time of the proposal submission starts or after so uh, it depends on uh, organization to organization if you are asking some person uh, who you know personally then obviously you can ask them to Uh, review it before as well, and other organizations have mentors who are available before the period as well. Some other organizations may say that we only see uh, the proposals once the starting uh, date has begun. So it uh, depends on organization to organization. But if you if you know the person uh, mentor personally, then uh, they will be able to review it before as well. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. And yeah, also Mayu has said uh, that proposals are fine, but the most important thing is that previous contribution should be uh, good, and uh, when you submit the proposal, so that you have a good footing and uh, among the competitors. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sure, I will contribute to the code base. then uh, does anyone have other questions so uh, if uh, anyone else does not have any other question or something they want to so not necessarily question if you want to explore uh, a part of the project do you want to clear something about the project itself you can do as well you can ask question about contributions uh, otherwise then uh, if we do not have that then we we might be in, in the workshop soon so it's kind of uh, you know last chance to get in the questions before we end uh like if i want to make a trigger for uh, one of the functionality in event a so where should i write the code of trigger if you want to change something what uh, i want to make a sql trigger for some action like uh, clicking on some button and after that a action should be performed on database or something related to that okay so uh you would want to first create an api for that uh, for example uh, if you want to insert something into the database so let's say this is the api we recently created we wanted to delete the uh, unused discount codes so first of all we created a new route for event discount code de uh, delete and used we mark that the method uh, it should operate on is http delete then we wrote the code here that find the discount codes which do not have any order 
and uh, for which the event ID is equal to the event ID we got from the URL. And then we delete this and commit the session and return that how many uh, discount codes were deleted. And then in the front end, you would use, uh, let's say there's a button which says that delete the unused discount codes. And then you would write this action and then uh, a function's name. And in the, uh, let's, let me show you the uh, real life example for that. So for example, this is a delete moderator action. And uh, in the template, we have this loop where we are showing the moderator email. And with, in, on the cross button, we have written this action that the, this dot delete moderator, and then we pass in the moderator as the argument and here we receive this moderator as the argument so i'm uh, mixing two things but basically if you have a button you uh, mark an action on it and then in the javascript file whenever you click the button this particular action will run and then here you can call any api you can call uh, the delete uh, discount code API and this code will run on the server and the database change will happen. So you don't trigger an SQL change on the front end itself. So it's not uh, a direct thing that you click on the button and something is triggered in the database. You, so, uh, you click on a button, an action is triggered, a JavaScript function is run. In that function, you might call an API. That API will reach the server this function on the server will run and your code will then execute and you can change anything in the database in the server okay thank you you explained very well like um i have to say you are very good at explaining the code base Sari. like it, it seems to be so easy like uh, first click the button action will be bind with the button and on clicking of the button action will be performed in the javascript file and then the database changes will be happen in the mysql thank you yeah so uh, then we are coming to the end of the session does anyone else have any questions before we close the session Then, Shubham, I think that people uh, are clear and they don't have any uh, other questions. So uh, I think uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. And uh, I'll let Shubham take it from here. Yes, thank you, Arif, for the stand. And now we will perform our ritual as on the ending workshop. So I'll request all of you to switch on your camera if possible and we'll take a picture as that this would be our last session with Arip sir and i have attended all three workshops and it was great like attending all threes so if possible you can also switch on your cameras so we have mario ajhar ali k dev yes nice raj ching Fai, Neha, Eric, Sui. Yes, hello, Raj.
Yeah, Arif, Arif has his own swag, like all workshops, wearing his NY cap and sitting with all confidence. Yo. Are you, you want to say some words? We cannot hear you, Mario. You are on mute. That's that's correct. That's the famous sentence. You're on mute. You're not audible. So um, thank you very much for this workshop. Um, we appreciate. Um, um, yeah, of course, uh, Arib. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, it's 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 really nice to see these workshops. So we'll post them in the upcoming hours. Uh, so you can go back and uh, watch the video on the FOSS Asia channel. And um, yeah. I hope uh, we see you in the community. We see you contributing or maybe using the platform. So keep in touch and uh, have a good evening. Thank you very much. Back to you, Shubham. Yes, so uh, this was our ending of day eight of Force Asia Summit. Tomorrow we have one more energetic day, one more day with lots of workshops and lots of working. So I hope I'll see you all soon there within no time. So. With this, I end today's workshop. Thank All you. of you take care and have a good evening. Bye-bye. Good to see you. Bye.